Good morning. You know, we all have a part in sharing God's love and his Bible truth with others. You know, God's had people through all the ages who shared his truth and how much they loved him. They were just ordinary people. They were the disciples. They were like us, just ordinary folks. But the one thing that was different, they were totally sold out, 100%, 100% committed, loyal, steadfast, unswerving in their faith, and bound to being Jesus' faithful followers. It was not halfway. It was not lukewarm. It was not uncommitted. It was the real deal, the real thing. They were convicted of Jesus and biblical truth. And there's two words this morning that I want you to understand. Conviction and preference. Conviction is a strong belief that you are not going to change. It's a strong feeling that your beliefs are right, and if you don't adhere to them, you're sinning. Preference is is a fact of liking or wanting to do one thing more than another. Now, the Supreme Court makes a difference between the two, between conviction and preference. They say preference is a very strong belief. It can be held with great strength. You can give your life in full-time service. You can also give all your money. You can energetically proselytize. You can also teach these beliefs to your children. And the Supreme Court may still rule it's a preference. A preference is a strong belief, but a belief that you will change under the right circumstances. Those circumstances could be peer pressure, family pressure, lawsuits, jail, or threat of death. But now a conviction is a belief you will not change. Why? Because you believe God requires it of you. Conviction, you are willing to stand by your beliefs, even alone. Preferences are not protected by the Constitution. Convictions are protected by our Constitution. And convictions on the inside will always show up on the outside in a person's lifestyle. Now this morning, we are going to have a true story for you to consider about some ordinary people who lived their lives convicted of God's biblical truth and Jesus' salvation and how God blessed them. And now we're going to go to Frankfurt, Germany during World War II. And here we find Franz and Helene Hasel, two Seventh-day Adventist Germans, and their children. Franz had served in the German army during World War I when he was 18 years old. And now as a, it, he was 40 years old at the beginning of World War II. And things were different now. Between the two wars, he had become a Christian and a Seventh-day Adventist. And then he served the church as a call porter selling books. And then he became the conference publishing director. He had married Helene, and they had had three children by World War II time. Well, in 1939, everyone in Germany knew Hitler was preparing for war. He wanted to rule the world. Franz thought he wouldn't be called up. He'd served in World War I, and now he was 40. But one Saturday night, after a wonderful Sabbath with the family outdoors that afternoon, he opened the mail to discover he was to report Monday morning at 8 a.m. On Monday morning, uh, he was to be in Pioneer Company 699. It was the same one he'd served in during World War I. It was a prestigious engineering group assigned the task of building bridges um, wherever Hitler planned his next advance. They took orders directly from Hitler. So on Monday morning, he got a haircut, he got his uniform, and he got his orders to leave on Wednesday. On Wednesday, the family together, gathered together, and he read from Psalm 91, verses 5 through 11. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flies by day. A thousand shall fall at thy side, side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. And next the family sang their favorite hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, written by Martin Luther. Afterwards they kneeled, knelt, and held hands while he prayed. Our Father, I've been drafted as a soldier. You know I have no interest in war and fighting. You know I found no joy in battle back in the Great War, even when I wasn't a Christian, but much less so now. Father, please be with us as our paths separate. Help me to be true to my faith, even in the army. 
Help me so that I will not have to kill anyone. And please bring me back safely and protect my family from all the dangers of war. Amen. He put his trust in God. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him will I trust. And then he was gone. After a three-hour train ride, the men settled into their quarters at boot camp. One of the first he did, things he did was to search out the captain. It's called the Hop, Hauptmann in German. And he said, you know, sir, I am a Seventh-day Adventist. I worship God on Saturday, as the Bible teaches us to do. I would like to be excused from reporting for duty on my Sabbath day. Also, I do not eat pork or anything else that comes from pigs. I respectfully request permission to receive a substitute whenever pork is served. The Hopman Micus shrugged. Well, if you can work out the details with the lieutenant, I'm agreeable. Lieutenant Peter Gutchalk was not happy. You must be mad, Private. This is the German army. This battalion is going to war, and you want Saturday off? Get out of my sight. Well, if you want to trade work with other soldiers, okay. But once the advance starts, well, the war is not going to come to a standstill so you can keep your Sabbath. Don't shirk your duty or I'll personally see you live to regret it. Back to the barracks, Frowns asked men if they'd swap Sunday duty with him. Several agreed, as there was special entertainment on Sunday. That solved, he headed to the kitchen and explained his dietary principles to the head cook to see if he could get substitutes. See that pot, Hazel? I got one kettle. The food gets cooked in it, all of it. You eat what everybody eats or you starve. Pork indeed. But they were billeted in a house across the street from a dairy store. So he visited and asked the owner if he could trade his dairy products for pork. Well, of course he would. Franz gave all his pork, lard, and sausage to the dairy man, and he received milk and butter in return. The other soldier said, well, what are you going to do when we get to the front? He said, God will take care of me. But one more item remained. Franz had made it a habit of reading his Bible through yearly. He knew morning and evening devotions would not be easy, but he sat on the cot, he read his Bible, and he prayed. Of course, he got the name Bible Reader and also Carrot Eater. And he was also ridiculed with jokes and laughter, shoes and pillows thrown at him. But Lieutenant Gutchalk, he was the worst. He tried to humiliate Franz at every turn. At morning roll call, he would ask, Hazel, had your worship yet? Franz would salute smartly and say, yes, sir. Then he'd hear in return, how can you believe those fairy tales? You must be soft in the head. Then he replied, well, it's interesting, Lieutenant, but I just read about people like you in 2 Peter 3.3. 3. He whipped out his Bible and read, First of all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. Lieutenant, this was written more than 1,900 years ago. Thank you, sir, for confirming that the Bible is true and strengthening my faith. Gutshog was not happy. He remained his enemy. <clears throat> At Christmas time, a big hearty party was held. The tables were decorated and carols were sung. But then as the liquor flowed, the party became rowdy and the jokes coarse. So Franz took his grape juice and left and spent the rest of the evening reading his Bible. The next day, the major and the captain stopped him. Franz, we noticed you stayed sober last night. And we appreciate that very, very much. And a couple days later, he was promoted to private first class and received a medal. And he was also relieved of all outdoor work and he became the night guard inside the office. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. <clears throat> Everywhere they went, they had to build bridges. As Hitler moved the war to conquer Russia, the pioneers were ordered to move across Poland, then the Ukraine, and then into Russia. This time on foot, as the motorized vehicles were sent ahead. <clears throat> Franz prayed, Dear Lord, it's been easy to keep your Sabbath by trading work, but now we're at the front and things have changed. Please help me, and help came every week. They walked all week long, and they were exhausted. So the Hopman announced a rest tomorrow on Sabbath. The next week on Friday, a heavy downpour bogged the army down for a few days till it dried out. God arranged events so that every week Franz's Sabbath hours were protected all the way to the end of the war except for one period of final hectic retreat when he lost track of time. Franz kept every Sabbath. That took conviction and fervent prayer. 
His truth shall be your shield and buckler. Now, Helene and the children had problems back at home, too. The pressure to join the Nazi party was strong. But when she was asked, she declared, I belong to the party of Jesus Christ. I don't need another party. That didn't win friends, but she stood firm. And with fewer men in Germany, that meant fewer farmers and much less food. So they gleaned a potato field. Every day after school, she took the three children and a little cart, and they went to the fields, and they dug up little cherry-sized potatoes. <clears throat> they filled up burlap sacks, 100 pounds at a time, and they didn't stop until the ground would, was frozen hard. It was grueling, brack labor, but they had 30 sacks full, enough to last the winter. The children were brainwashed at school and made to listen to lengthy political harangues. But the greater problem was Sabbath keeping. Even the president of the local church conference recommended that the church members send their children to school on Sabbath until the war was over. He assured the flock that God would understand under extreme circumstances. But Helene remembered Francis' parting prayer to help us be faithful to what we believe, and they remembered to keep the Sabbath day, to keep it holy. <clears throat> She was determined to be faithful. So on Sabbath mornings, they would get up, get ready, and very quietly leave the house to take the tram to church. The school principal interrogated her over the matter, but she stood firm. Then the leader of the Nazi League of Women tried to get her to sign up by holding out a carrot, shall we say, with the children being able to go on summer vacation to get new clothes and shoes and plenty of rations for more food. But Helene always stood firm for God. Fearing arrest for the denying the Nazi party, she knew their family needed a safe haven. And a close Adventist friend, Tante Fischer, from Germany's Black Forest, insisted that they come visit and live with her. So they packed up a few things and took the six-hour train ride to the country. And there, her animals lived in stables on the ground floor of her stucco home and the people lived upstairs. I think you can see at the bottom there, I don't know if you can tell, but that's either a donkey or a horse and it's going into the door. It's headed to the door right there at the bottom. The kids lived with large black fir trees, the cow and the goats and the chickens, and especially the good food. After their potato winter, they gladly picked greens for salads. They played in the hayloft, they took long hikes in the forests and the mountains, they helped with the harvest, and they even found a little black kitten, as you see there. On Sabbaths, they had home Sabbath school and prayer service in the living room. But that fall, the local mayor demanded all evacuees return home immediately. So they had to leave for Frankfurt again. Back in the Ukraine, war was hardening the men. The pioneer unit marched 30 miles a day on foot, carrying their guns and field packs across the country heading into Russia. <clears throat> the provisions ran so low that the men were eating only old moldy bread. That's all they had, and it took its toll. Men fell by the wayside, suffering from heat stroke. They would be carried to the shade of a tree and left to their fate. Others developed such blisters on their feet they could not tolerate walking in their boots or barefoot. Once they could walk no more, they had to stop too. The lucky ones became prisoners of war, but most were killed outright by the Russians. After several days, Franz' feet also got blisters and became infected. He drug himself along until they made camp for the night. He was running a fever and moaning when his friend Willie removed his boots and helped him over to a little stream, a muddy stream, and got his feet in it. His feet were swollen twice their normal size. He did not stop Bible study. And he turned his Bible and opened and it fell open at Psalm 118, 17. I will not die, but live. And I will proclaim what the Lord has done. Then he prayed as his body shook with fever. Dear Lord, you know my life is committed to you. When I left home, I was assured that you would bring me back safe to, your fa to my family. But now you've given me another promise. But here I am. I'm sick. I'm unable to continue. Unless you help me, I am lost. I know you are a promise-keeping God, and I commit myself into your hands. And he dropped off to sleep. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. A wake-up call at 3.15 the next morning. Franz rubbed his eyes, the sleep out of his eyes, and his headache and his shaking were gone. 
He pulled his feet out from under the blanket and he looked at them in the dim light. Wait, this can't be. My feet, they're completely healed. They're not covered with the scabs. I got completely new unbroken skin. From that point on, Franz never had any foot troubles again. <laughs> you shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day. As they continued through Russia with battles and bridge building, Sergeant Eric Newhouse told Franz, I noticed you are the only man in our company who has not gotten a scratch or a bruise in this war. The bullets always miss you. From now on, you and I are going to share the same quarters. You're going to be my guardian angel. And that arrangement continued to the end of the war. Now, Exodus 20 in the Ten Commandments tells us thou shalt not kill. <clears throat> Franz knew that. He did not want to be tempted to shoot or kill anyone. He was especially good at target practice. He, he usually hit the bullseye. He was known as the company sharpshooter. But to make sure he never killed anyone, he had a wooden look-alike gun carved, which looked like the top of his pistol. He put his shoe polish, got it black, he took his real pistol, threw it in a lake, and he kept that fake gun in his holster for the remainder of the war. That incident would have, been, would have been considered treason by the German government had they known about it, and they would have killed him. <clears throat> On the Eastern Front, the temperature dropped to minus 45 to minus 60 Fahrenheit, and Franz's unit was ordered to head to Stalingrad. But right before they arrived there, Hitler ordered them to turn away and head to the Black Sea. That was a huge blessing because almost 100% of the German troops stationed at Stalingrad were killed. By this time, Franz had been promoted to the company clerk in charge of pay and obtaining supplies for the unit. He went ahead of the group into small villages and he obtained food. As he did, he quietly warned any Jews that he saw to immediately escape with their family to the forests as the SS troops were right behind his unit. Some of them believed and lived. Others didn't, and they perished. A few of his friends suspected what he was up to and warned him he could be killed for treason. But he continued, and friends did what they could to protect him. They told their comrades, leave this guy alone, won't you? You ought to be glad. He's scouting around, and he buys local food for us. Why else do you think we're so well stocked with food? We get fresh eggs. We get candy and other luxuries. So everybody, keep quiet. And they did. <clears throat> Back in Frankfurt, things got worse for the family. Helene would not join the Nazi group, nor allow her children to. <clears throat> and one day, Franz's paycheck stopped arriving. Church members helped what they could, but that didn't last long. She wrote letters to the government and the welfare agencies explaining her situation and begging to receive her sustenance check. No response. Then she wrote Franz to tell him. She received a reply, but not from Franz, from the Nazi party. She must pay them a visit. Seemed her letter undermined troop morale and was treason, punishable by death. You will hear from us. Next, please. On Sabbath morning, the entire church prayed for their family. Not longer, she received another letter from the Nazi party headquarters in central Frankfurt to appear before Herr Springer, the party head. Party headquarters was in the Brown House. Most people that went to the Brown House never returned. She sent her children off with other church members and she went to the Brown House, third floor, Herr Springer's office. As she sat in the chair, the man behind the desk held up a folder and said, these documents are condemning. You refuse to join the party. You refuse to join the League of Women. Your children won't go to school on Saturday. And here's a subversive letter to your husband. Are you a Jew? No, I'm Aryan. Well, what's going on? Why won't you cooperate? Sir, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. In the Ten Commandments, God tells us to keep the Sabbath and worship him on the seventh day and keep it holy. His laws are still valid today. That's why I keep the Sabbath and why I cannot join the Nazi party. He asked his assistant, you check and see if Franz Helene Hazel is a member of the Seventh-day Adventist church. A couple minutes later, confirmed. Then he said, do you know the Schneiders? Well, of course she did. Brother Schneider was an elder in the church. He continued, well, they're our neighbors. 
When we got bombed out, they invited us over for dinner and gave us towels and bedding so that we could make a new start. They really sacrificed for us. They're really wonderful people, and I've got a lot of respect for those Adventists. I'll get to the bottom of your situation. You know for sure you will receive your child support payments. <sighs> Thank you so much, Herr Springer, and God bless you for your kindness. With a strange expression on his face, he opened the door for her. Frau Hazel, Herr Springer woke up very ill this morning. He was unable to come to work. I'm simply filling in for him today. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you. <clears throat> a few days later, she was notified that she could pick up a check containing all her back payments. Back at the war, one Sabbath morning, Franz spent the day very close to camp, but in the woods. He would be undisturbed in Bible study and meditation that way. He sure needed some quiet time with the Lord. He was so depressed. He was more than a thousand miles away from home and family. He prayed, Lord, you see my state of mind. If you're still with me, please give me a sign. And then he sang another verse of a mighty fortress. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. For two weeks, the Russian tanks advanced toward the village, but the German Stukas bombed them. The shooting was incessant. Early the next morning, he awoke with a start. It was a low rumbling noise, very far away. He leaped out of bed, jumped in his boots, and dashed out of the room and across the street to the observation tower. Four roads led into the village, and three of them were filled with Russian tanks heading their direction. Up, up, he yelled to the others. One road is open, and we ought to leave now. The men were up in a flash, cranked the jeep and the truck, and Franz rushed back to the quarters. There was his soldier's pay for Wednesday and all the documents with the top secret bulletins about future moves of the German army. Standing orders were always to burn everything, but there was no time. What to do? He grabbed a piece of chalk and wrote on the door, danger, mines, do not enter. Then he dashed to where the huge diesel truck, pulling its trailer, was driving off. His comrades had not realized they were leaving him behind. But with a running leap, Franz landed on the connecting tow bar and clung to the coupling, trying desperately to keep his balance while the truck bounced over potholes. We're going to make it, he prayed out loud. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> Just then the driver made a sharp right turn and the dr truck bed angled toward Franz and toppled him from his perch. He landed on the road, his head two feet from the front wheel of the trailer. So, it's not battle. This is the end. Save me, Lord. Forgive my sins. Watch over my family. The wheel touched his skull. But just then, someone grabbed him by the collar of his uniform, wrenched him away from the wheel, and with one gigantic lifting movement, deposited him on the very top of the trailer. For a moment, he sprawled there, dazed and shaking. Then he lifted his head and looked around for his rescuer to thank him. But there was no one. Then trembling and sobbing, Franz thanked God for giving him the sign he had prayed for. He remembered the words that seemed so impersonal to him on Sabbath. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. <clears throat> Back in Frankfurt, the family was struggling to get enough food, and the air raid siren, the sirens at night caused the family to make fearful trips to the bunkers. The shelter was, were designed for 2,000 people, but they usually held three or 4,000 people. By the time they were over, the oxygen was running out in those rooms. They were packed in so tightly, like sardines, that her children learned to lift up their legs and go back to sleep until it was all over. One evening at home, there was a knock at the door, and there stood a tall, muddy stranger, Papa. Papa! It was really him. He was home. He'd been given a three-week furlough, and it took him one week just to get home. But what a reunion they had. He had been able to purchase food as he went home, so they feasted on food and each other's company for a week. And then he left. One night, about nine months later, Helene gave birth to their fourth child, Susie. Just three hours later, 
The sirens went off, and they had to hurry out into the icy night to the bomb shelter. The shelter shook from the pressure of the explosions as the bombs dropped closer and closer. Helene felt ill as the air became hot and foul. Everyone feared for their lives. Women fainted, but there was no space to lay them down. They had to remain upright because of the press of the crowd. When the doors opened and they went home, Helene made a decision. Never would they seek shelter in that bunker again. From then on, they went down to the basement in their own apartment building. That was the plan, but after many nights with several trips downstairs, they set up their beds in the basement. Then they slept peacefully. I will both lie down in peace and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me to dwell in safety. When Susie was only three weeks old, an order arrived for all women with children to leave the city. So Helene packed what she could, plus the baby buggy, and managed to get all four of them on the train. She didn't know where they were going, but it took them to Eschenrod, a small village in the Vogelberg, Vogelsberg Mountains. Each farmer, except for those over 70, were required to house evacuees from the city. But nobody wanted a family of five. Although retirees didn't have to take anyone in, a devout Lutheran couple, the Josts, took them in. They'd never had any children. The Hazels made themselves helpful right away. Helene helped with the cooking and cleaning. The children cleaned. They helped with the chores around the farm. It was a blessing for all, and they became lifelong friends. Well, one day in the area, they, some liberated Polish prisoners of war looted the entire village. They herded off all the animals, they ripped up the vegetables out of the gardens, they slashed clothes off the lines, and they ripped haystacks apart. Every house was looted, except for one, the Josts. None of their things were damaged, and Helene's clothes still fluttered on the line. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler. It took Franz and a couple of his buddies three months to get back to the pioneer unit after their leaves. And one morning, Hoffman Micus ordered France into his office and, so that he could answer Bible questions. At the meeting, Micus answered, asked a few basic Bible questions, and then Franz says, Hoffman Micus, I understand you were a history teacher before the war. Is that right? Well, yes, it is. Well, then, sir, I wonder if you could help me. Well, I'll do my best. The Bible contains some prophecies with historical content that were written about 600 B.C., I've always wanted to check them out with an expert in the field. Would you be willing for me to present them and then you give me your feedback on the accuracy of the facts? Well, flattered, he responded, well, I'd be glad to. You go right ahead. So Franz proceeded to share with the Hoffman and two others the image of Daniel 2 with the dates and events of each part of that image, which depicted Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. And when he was done, he'd said, I would appreciate if you could point out any errors. Well, no, there weren't any errors. Everything's accurate. I never heard of anything so amazing in my life. And I wanted you to see Franz used this little postcard. He had typed a little more of the details on that he had received when he was baptized back in the 20s. Franz then explained about the 10 toes being the 10 tribes of modern Europe and the iron and clay not sticking together. He concluded that the Fuhrer could not win this war. It's not possible for him to unite Europe under his leadership and establish a thousand year right. The Bible's predictions have been proved accurate again and again. Franz stated, if they're accurate here, it means we're fighting a losing battle. The Hoffman sat back. Hazel, I appreciate what you shared. From now on, we're no longer gonna operate one third of our motorized vehicles. The gas rations we're going to save, I want you to store in drums and canisters so that when the end comes, we have enough fuel to get home. The war had gone on six years. Helene and the children again had to escape the terrors of Frankfurt. They hid with the Josts in the Vogelberg's mountains again, which was near France. After they got there the next morning, Helene prayed with her children. Thank you, Lord, for once again protecting us and bringing us safely to this haven deep in the Vogelberg's mountains. No one saw us leave home. No one knows where we are. Please, God, let us have some peace here, and please watch over our papa. It's been months since we last heard from him. He was in Russia then, but you know where he is, and you can guard him just as well as you're guarding us here. And they all said, Amen. 
A couple weeks later, the Americans were approaching. A steady stream of defeated German soldiers was coming through the village. The villagers all hung out white sheets out of the windows to signal the Americans of their surrender. And then the Americans were there. Attention, attention, anyone leaving their houses will be shot. Remain inside. Then there was a loud knocking at the door. About 35 American soldiers crowded in. They were hungry, but friendly. Fra Jost was scared. She hid in the attic. But Helene got out eggs, bread, and cider, and fried eggs to feed the men. The occupation forces ruled with a light hand, unless they were threatened. The Americans were pushing the Germans back all the way through France and into Germany, and the Russians were doing the same thing in Russia on the Eastern Front. They were getting surrounded. The Pioneer Unit was now in the Crimea, and they had suffered heavy losses. Any replacements fell almost immediately as they were sending boys of 15 and 16 with no experience or training. But finally, the order to retreat arrived. Often the Red Army was all, only two hours behind them. The men traveled day and night to stay ahead of the pursuing Russians. They finally crossed the border into Romania. It was during this helter-skelter retreat that Franz lost all track of time. In the years of war, it was only the only Sabbath that he had not kept. He was in charge of 30 horse-drawn wagons. He kept them on the road, which, with all the escapees, moved at a snail's pace. They were forced off the roads at the bridges, which he had to ford. Since he took or they took orders from Hitler directly, they managed to be able to drive the roads at night from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. when everyone else was ordered not to travel. Since they were the only ones traveling at night, they made good time. They covered 30 miles a night and reached Budapest in 18 days. At that point, Hoffman Micas decided to proceed with the trucks only. Most other units had already abandoned their vehicles because of lack of fuel. But thanks to the gas they had hoarded for 18 months, they had plenty of fuel to get all the way home. They rushed and they crossed the border into Austria. But then every direction they went, they were ordered to head a different direction, which made no sense. But since Franz had lived and call portered in Austria for nine years, he told the Hoffman, sir, I know this country like the palm of my hand. I can get us to Mariazell on back roads, if you like. Franz, take over. Up and down the back roads they went, through the Alps, and they reached Mariazell before any other units. And on May 8, 1945, the war was over. The Germans surrendered, and a treaty was signed. All Germans who could cross the river ends by 11 a.m. the next morning would become American prisoners of war. The ones that didn't would be left in the Russians' hands. Franz, the sergeant, and another comrade were able to have a truck, and they left. They managed to cross that river at 10.30 a.m. the next morning with 30 minutes to spare, and they were in the hands of the Americans. They joined 140,000 German prisoners of war who were already there. When the retreat began, they were among the troops farthest away from Germany, and they had covered the greatest distance. I want you to look at this map. Oh, I don't have my pointer up here. They started right there. They went into France, and then they went up through Germany, through Poland, through the Ukraine, into the, what's now the Soviet Union, used to be Russia. They went almost to Stalingrad when they were turned back, and they came they went down to the Caucasus to Baku. Baku is in Azerbaijan. That's 2,971 miles from Frankfurt. Wow. And see, then here they came back through here, the Crimea, Odessa, Romania, Hungary, back into Austria, up and down, and there's the river ends. After a few restful days, Franz was mustered out. And after a physical, the American colonel looked at his service record and saw Franz was supposed to be court-martialed after the war. Well, why was this? I refused an order for religious reasons. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. I keep the Sabbath holy, as the Bible tells us. And once on Sabbath, there was an attack, and I refused to do duty because it was Sabbath. The colonel was incredulous. You can't be serious, man. All through the war, you kept the Sabbath in the Nazi army, and you survived? Yes, sir. God protected me even in the German army. That's amazing. I'm a Jew myself, but even in the American army, I don't keep Sabbath because it's too difficult. <clears throat> I certainly recommend you do keep the Sabbath, sir. <clears throat> Since they were only allowed to release farm workers at that time, the colonel wrote, agricultural inspector, 
on his paperwork and he was free to go. Of the original <clears throat> 1,200 pioneers, only seven survived and only three were not wounded. Franz Hazel, the man with the wooden pistol, was one of the three. A thousand shall fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. After more weeks, Franz made it back to Frankfurt, and then he had to go to Eschenrod to get his family. After six years of war and separation, they were finally together again. And he got to be with his family and get to know Susie. He went to the conference office. Since there was no publishing work, he was hired as a pastor for several churches in the Frankfurt area. Since the members had no money to pay tithe, they often gave him food. He once brought home 100 pounds of chicken feed, which they cooked for breakfast, but it left their voices hoarse most of the day. One time they got a big box of beans, but they were filled with weevils. She cooked them anyway. They scraped the weevils off and ate them. I know it sounds horrible, but that's all they had. Winter arrived, and there was still not enough food or clothing, and coal was still rationed. One week, their ration cards were used up, and they had only a half a, lo bread, half a loaf of bread to last five more days. Franz asked Helene if she would go back to Eschenrod and the Josts and hamster some food. That was a term used for going to the country and either begging or buying food from the farmers. It was illegal, but most everybody did it because they had to eat. So the next morning, she took the train to Eschenrod. It was snowing in Frankfurt. It was very cold, but it was clear in the village when she pulled in. After she got to Eschenrod, and that's Eschenrod today, you can see it's still just a little bitty village right now. Back then it was fewer, and she had to walk two miles to get to their house, and it started snowing but they were happy to see her. After a good visit and some warm food, she shared their needs. So Fra Jost set out many other things, oil, butter, flour, bread, sugar, eggs, potatoes, dried fruits, a little cake, and many other things. It weighed about 80 pounds in her three big bags. She was packed so full for the family, she looked like St. Nicholas with big packages, but at least hunger would be banished for many weeks. She planned to leave early the next morning, but it was snowing heavily. The Jost insisted that she stay, and they would take her to the train later in the day or the following day, but she would have none of it. Her children were home and they were hungry, so she began walking the two miles toward the train station. She did not realize how tired she was, how cold it was, how deep the snow had gotten, how heavy her packages were. The snow was so heavy she couldn't see 10 feet in front of her. Every few feet she would stop, take a few breaths and go on. She prayed, Lord, please help me. She reached the top of the hill and noticed the signpost, one mile to the station. She was so tired. She shut her eyes for a moment. I must not fall asleep. I must not. I just need a few minutes to catch my breath and then I'll continue. But she began to feel, oh, so comfortably warm. Once more, her eyes closed and they, did, they stayed that way. As she leaned against the signpost, she began to be covered by fluffy snowflakes. But the next instant, she was enveloped by a circle of light, and then she looked again and saw white, white angels circling her. Such peace. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. The rumble of an approaching motor roused her. She jerked awake. A diesel truck was laboring up the hill. She tried to raise her hand to flag him down, but her stiff limbs would not obey. In despair, she saw that truck continue slowly up the hill. Sleep washed over her once again, and then a voice said, now you will see a miracle of God. Will I get home, she asked. Your suffering is almost over, only another moment. Just then, a hand shook her on the shoulder. Each time she tried to raise her head, it just drooped forward, but the shaking continued. She thought, I'm so warm, I don't want to wake up. Wake up, wake up, a rough voice kept saying. You got to wake up, you're about to freeze. Annoyed, she finally opened her eyes to see a man standing in front of her. I parked my truck at the top of the hill. I couldn't stop here, or I'd never make it up. You come with me now, I'll give you a ride. He half dragged, half carried her to the cab. He went back, got all three of her bags and put them in the truck. Then he gave her a drink of hot tea from his thermos, wrapped blankets around her, and turned the heat up to high before continuing on his journey. They talked about how close a call it was, how she had almost frozen to death. She thanked him for picking her up 
You know, he said, the interesting thing is I never come this way. This is the first time I've ever been along this route. It's useless for me to take you to the train search station. They are searching all the trains. Any black market food is confiscated. It'd be a shame for you to lose all that food, especially after what you've been through. Where do you live anyway? After she explained it was a suburb of Frankfurt, he said, oh, that's not much out of the way. I'll take you there. She then fell asleep and awoke as the truck stopped right in front of her apartment. She'd never told him exactly where she lived. He lifted out her bags, helped her down the steep step. Oh, I can't thank you enough, she said. With a nod of his head, he climbed back into the cab. She stooped to slip the bag straps over her shoulder, and then she turned to have a last glance at the disappearing truck. She looked down the entire length of the street. There was no truck. There were no tracks in the freshly fallen snow. Franz served as a pastor until the publishing work returned in 1950. He became publishing secretary for the Central European Division of Seventh-day Adventists. He continued to preach in every church in Germany on a rotating basis. At his death at age 92, he had read the Bible through 89 times. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I'll be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Helene developed crippling arthritis after the war, but she wrote over 200 poems and died at the age of 82. Kurt married and became a pastor in Germany where he retired. Lottie, Gerd, and Susie, all married, came to the U.S. and worked for our Seventh-day Adventist universities or union conferences, and their children still, their children still serve today. And I recommend that you set your love completely and totally on him. And I think we will see stories similar to this and greater than this in the times that are ahead of us. Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, may we remember your words. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. In Jesus' name, amen.